Hello and welcome to The Bazooka, the season finale for internal medicine. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we'll look at 10 Oscar stations in one clinical course. Now, because this is a season finale, we're going to be looking at 20 Oscar stations in one clinical course, and we're going to be covering internal medicine. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel, drop a like, drop a comment, share the page to someone who's writing exams, grab your piece of paper, grab your pen, and let's go. Apologies for any graphical images that are present in this presentation as they are only used for teaching purposes. So station one, a male 42 HIV positive with headache and weight loss for three weeks. He last took his art two years ago. He is confused, wasted, has oral thrush, and you note non-painful lesions on his face. Comment on the skin lesions. What is the differential diagnosis for the skin lesion? What is the likely complete diagnosis for this presentation? What four cardinal investigations, not procedures, would you order? What drugs are used to treat the diagnosis in above, in part three above? Name any two. So I'll give you two seconds to think about that. Okay, so here comes the answer. So most likely these lesions here, as you can see, this one here looks umbilicated right on the center. They are dome-shaped. They are papules. So they are umbilicated dome-shaped brown papules. And the differential diagnosis is, of course, molluscum contagiosum, uh, coccidioidal mycosis, cutaneous cryptococcosis, even cutaneous histoplasmosis. And most likely this uh, patient has molluscum contagiosum in an RVDR patient. WHO stage three. I'm putting them. I'm putting him at stage three because he has the PPEs, which are part of, or the skin manifestations, which are part of WHO stage two. The oral thrush is part of stage three. The weight loss is also, if not so significant, is part of stage three, unless if he has HIV wasting syndrome. Now the headache that's maybe plus or minus a, a CNS. OI infection. So if there is a presence of a CNS OI infection, that would move him to a WHO stage four. And what four cardinal investigations would you order? So a CT scan of the head, a CD4 count, a viral load, and you do a lumbar puncture for CSF microscopy culture and sensitivity as well as CSF biochemistry. It's not just enough to say lumbar puncture because lumbar puncture is a procedure. So you go on to say lumbar puncture for CSF microscopy, culture, sensitivity, and biochemistry. Then what two drugs are used to treat the diagnosis? So antiretroviral drugs, pretty much zidovudine and lamuvudine, which are the two types of drugs that are used. Station two, a male 57 known diabetic and hypertensive for six years, unknown HIV status, developed abdominal fullness, but no pain. A month ago, developed leg swelling both two months ago and noticed face was puffy in the mornings. Urine is frothy. He has associated gradual increasing shortness of breath with no chest pains. He developed spontaneous bruising over the past five months. What is the most likely diagnosis? What investigation will you do and give the findings you would expect for each test? List possible causes, four possible causes. So I'll give you two seconds to think through this. Okay, so here comes the answer. So most likely this person has nephrotic syndrome. And what gives it away is because you have this edema, especially that's ar around the face, and that usually is um, at high intensity in the mornings and usually subsides during the day. And in addition to this, you have this frothy urine. You also have features of congestion in the lungs with this progressive shortness of breath. And this obviously happens in patients that have kidney problems and most likely nephrotic syndrome, which is a syndrome where you lose proteins, predominantly albumin in the urine. So there's no, there's loss of this oncotic pressure and you have more fluid leaving the vascular space into the dependent areas. So what investigations would you do and what would you expect to find? You would do a 24 hour urine collection test and you would assess the amount of proteins that are present in there. So you would have more than 3.5 grams in a day. You would do a urine albumin creatinine ratio, which is most specific for proteinuria and 
for the diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome, you would get a ratio that's greater than 250 milligrams per millimole. And then you also do your urine protein creatinine ratio greater than 300 nanograms per millimole, not as sensitive as the urine albumin creatinine ratio. You would also check for serum albumin, which may be decreased. You do a lipid profile. You may see there is decreased cholesterol, decreased triglycerides, I mean, increased uh, cholesterol, increased triglycerides, increased LDLs, and low HDLs. I think this was switched. And then you do a renal biopsy where you would uh, take this for microscopy, histology, and immunohistocytochemistry where you may find the subtype of the nephrotic syndrome. Then you may also want to do a full blood count. There may be some derangements in the platelet count and list four possible causes. So Hypertensive nephropathy can cause this. Diabetic nephropathy can cause this. Systemic amyloidosis can cause this. SLE, which is systemic lupus erythematosus, can cause this. Infections such as malaria, Epstein-Barr virus, HIV, uh, hepatitis B virus, as well as hepatitis C virus. Station 3, a 45-year-old patient presents to the outpatient department with yellowing of the eyes of seven days duration. List focused questions you would ask the patient in your history that could help you arrive at a diagnosis. So I'll give you two seconds to think about it. Okay, here comes the answer. So you would first ask about the residence of this patient, where this patient stays, and if they're coming outside the country, why are you asking this? Because they could have contracted hepatitis B virus, they could have also contracted a malaria or any other infection. You ask for the presence of any of the following symptoms, if they have any pale stool, itchy skin, or dark urine. Of course, these are indications of an obstructive cause of the jaundice. You would also ask if there's any abdominal pains. You also ask if there's any fevers that may point you towards infections. You ask for any recent history of sexual activity. They may, this may point towards a hepatitis B of a virus. For, for example, if someone is having unprotected sexual intercourse with someone who has hepatitis B virus. Then you ask for a history of any blood transfusions or any infusion with pooled blood products or any organ donations that were done in the, in the past. You ask for the alcohol consumption, the type of alcohol they take, the amount, the number of years they've been drinking for, and the frequency. You ask for any drugs that have been taken in the previous two or three months because some drugs can cause jaundice. You also ask about recent surgeries that were done if they were some surgeries on the biliary tract or for any carcinomas. You ask for a history of recent travel, for example, keeping into mind hepatitis A as well as hepatitis E as well as malaria. You ask for a history of melina, which is a dark colored stool, as well as hematemesis, vomiting blood, which may point towards chronic liver disease. So station four, a 22-year-old male HIV patient is found to have a large right-sided pleural effusion. The left side of the chest is normal. Outline the findings you will get when you do a chest examination on this patient. List three causes of pleural effusion. So I'll give you two seconds to think about this. Okay, here comes the answer. So whenever I get such questions, I always imagine like as if I am examining the patient and I follow the normal schematic. So you would have inspection, you would have palpation, you would have percussion, and you'd have auscultation. So on inspection, I would expect to see these asymmetrical chest expansion. There may be a trail sign. A trail sign is just pretty much standing out of the stenocleidomastoid border, uh, the clavicular head of the stenocleidomastoid border on the side where the trachea has been deviated. So in this case, it's going to stand out on the left side because the trachea will deviate on the left side. There may be features of respiratory distress, so you may get use of accessory muscles, you may get nasal flaring, you may get intercostal as well as subcostal recessions. And then on palpation, the trachea may be deviated to the left side. There may be asymmetrical chest expansion on, on palpation. You may have decreased tactile fremitus on the right side, that's the affected side. And then on percussion, you get a stony dial percussion node on the right side. And then on auscultation, you get a reduced air entry on the right side with reduced vocal resonance. Then three causes of pleural effusions. It could be pleural effusions that are resulting in a transudate or pleural effusions that are resulting in an exudate. So you could have some causes such as mesotheliomas, which is a tumor of the pleural membranes. You could have an nephrotic syndrome. You could have congestive heart failure. You could have Meigs syndrome, which is a triad of 
an ovarian tumor, pleural effusion, as well as ascites. Then you could also have a pneumonia, a parapneumonic effusion. Station 5. What pathology is shown in the x-ray? List differentials for the above picture, about 4. What is the most or commonest a causative agent for this picture in our environment list the sites it can affect in the body. So take your time, look at this image. You can pause the video if you so wish. If you haven't yet subscribed, please hit the subscribe button right now and hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications of such videos every time I post. Here comes the answer. So as we can see from this x-ray, you have this bilateral miliary shadowing diffuse across both lungs then the differentials for this obviously would be miliary TB, histoplasmosis, sarcoidosis, pneumoconiosis, and pulmonary siderosis. And then the most common causative organism is, of course, mycobacterium tuberculosis, or in this case, TB. So the sites where TB can affect, remember TB is a multisystemic uh, condition, so it can affect the meninges, it can affect the brain, it can affect the spine, it can affect the bones, it can affect the spleen, it can even affect the bone marrow, it can affect the lymph nodes, it can affect the pericardium, it can even affect the endocardium, it can affect the liver, it can affect the kidneys, the abdomen, and the peritoneum. Station 6. A 65-year-old man presents to his cardiologist for checkup. Over the past two years, he has developed significant shortness of breath with exertion and easy fatigability. He has a past medical history of hypertension and coronary artery disease. On cardiac exam, there is a diastolic decrescendo murmur and bounding peripheral pulses. The physician also notes head bobbing. What is your diagnosis? What gold standard investigation are you going to do for him? List four other peripheral signs this patient can present with. What is the commonest cause of this diagnosis in developing countries? So I will give you 30 seconds to think through this question. Okay, so let's analyze this question and actually see what it's all about. So this person here has hypertension and they have coronary artery disease. And when you examine, you get that there's a murmur. That's a diastolic decrescendo murmur that's there in a bounding pulse as well as head bobbing. So obviously diastolic murmur that's decrescendo uh, type is usually suggestive of aortic regurgitation. Now, this here, I think, must have been a typo. It shouldn't be acute aortic regurgitation, but rather chronic aortic regurgitation because it's been happening over two years. So chronic aortic regurgitation in a known hypertensive patient, this is obviously in New York heart classification. Class three, because there are no symptoms at risk and they haven't given us that indication that there are symptoms at risk. The gold standard investigations you would do for this is an echocardiograph. And four other signs that you may see, you may see visible carotid pulsation. So the carotid may actually be dancing around in the neck. You refer to that as a Corrigan sign. You may see a demuset sign, which is already mentioned in the question where you have this head nodding or head bobbing with um, the heart's pulsation. But because they've already mentioned this, we shall remove this from the marking key. So you could also add what is known as a Derizet's sign, D-U-R-O-Z-I-E-Z, -E Derizet's sign. So these are like two and fro murmurs that are heard when you auscultate the femoral artery and when pressure is applied distally. Then you may get pulsations of the capillary bed. You call that as a queen case sign. You may get a molar sign, which is pulsations of the uvula with every heartbeat. Then what is the most commonest cause of the diagnosis in developing countries? So previously, it was actually known that rheumatic heart disease was the commonest cause, but now it's considered that bacterial endocarditis is actually a, a greater leading cause as compared to rheumatic heart disease. But of course, your marking schemes may still have rheumatic heart disease as the answer. 
Station seven, what is shown in the ECG? What is the diagnosis? List three possible causes. Feel free to pause the video at this moment. If you haven't gone through the ECG series videos, then my bad, this is going to be really hectic for you. But anyways, I'll give you two seconds to think through it. Okay, so here comes the answer. So if we look at this ECG, let me just zoom it for you so that we can look at it on the screen. So if we look at this ECG, we have lead one, lead two, lead three, AVR, AVL, AVF, V1, V2, V3, and then V4, V5, V6. These are known as uh, standard limb leads. These are known as augmented limb leads. These are known as chest leads, precordial leads. So the first thing that we check, of course, on an ECG is the patient details, of course, which are not given in this case. The second thing that we're going to be checking is the rate. But if you want, you could actually check the rhythm of this ECG. I think it's prudent that we should check the rhythm first. So if we look at the RR intervals, we look at this RR interval, we look at the next RR interval, we look at the third RR interval and the fourth RR interval, we can see that there is an irregularity that we can see between these RR intervals. That's the first thing that you need to note is that there is an irregularly irregular RR interval that you can see. Then the next thing that we determine is obviously the rate because this, this is irregular. So we're going to use this rhythm strip here and we're going to find out how many QRS complexes are present in 30 squares. So if we count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. So how, how many QRS complexes are present? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So there are about 14 QRS complexes. So that's roughly about 140 beats per minute. So the heart rate is tachycardic. Then the next thing that we look at is the presence of cardiac deviation. So we compare lead one and lead two, lead one and lead AVF. They are all facing upwards. So there is no axis deviation. So there's a normal cardiac axis. The next thing that we look at is of course the P waves. So can we identify any P waves? Usually the P waves are best identified from lead two. So as we can see here, we can see that there's a bump here, which appears kind of like a, T, a, a P wave. You have a curious complex here. You have a T wave, but no P wave here. You have a T wave here, no P wave there, no P wave here, no P wave here. So there's an absence of P waves that we can see there. Then we look at the PR interval. I'm not going to really spend a lot of time looking at the PR interval in this case. We can look at the QRS complexes. They look pretty much quite narrow and they look normal. So it's a narrow QRS complex. So this should give you an indication that the problem is coming from the atrium and is not really coming from the ventricle because if it were coming from the ventricle the curious complexes would look very strange then the next thing that we look at is of course our t waves so we see that the t waves are pretty present in the leads remember that in lead um, avr most of the waves are inverted so this is actually normal then then we look at the ST segment, as we can see the ST segments in lead V2 as well as lead V3 seem a bit elevated and you also have a poor RS progression in this ECG. So let's look at the answers and see what it says. So there's an irregularly irregular PRR interval. There's a tachycardia, approximately 140 bits per minute, a normal cardiac axis, absent P waves, the ST segment is elevated in V2 and V3, and there's a poor RS wave progression. So obviously this is atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular response. Some causes include ischemic heart disease, pericardial disease, COPDs, as well as thyrotoxicosis. Station eight, a, a male 19 is brought to the emergency department due to confusion, difficulty with arousal from sleep. He also has severe generalized headache, neck stiffness, and muscle aches. Temperature is 39, blood pressure is 102 over 68, pulse is 107 beats per minute, respiratory rate is 22 beats per minute. On physical examination, a particular rash is distributed on the thorax and extremities, while supine neck flexion leads to involuntary knee flexion. What is your diagnosis? What organism causes this diagnosis? What type of organism is it? What is the mode of transmission or infection? As we can see, they've even shown you the skin here. They've pretty much given you the diagnosis right here and 
it's right in front of your face. So I'll give you a second to think through it. So here comes the answer. So this is obviously an acute bacterial meningitis. Why do I say this is an acute bacterial meningitis? There are features of meningitis. So you have a headache and neck stiffness that's there. And of course, there is a fever. There is also going to be this particular rash, which is obviously seen in meningococcemia. Then you also have these meningeal signs that are present. So you should also know the difference between a Kerning sign and a Brzezinski sign. Then what organism causes this diagnosis is Neisseria meningitidis, and it is a gram-negative coffee bean-shaped diplococci. And what is the mode of transmission? It's through respiratory droplets. It can also be transmitted through a hematogenous spread via blood, but it's less common. Station 9. During your major ward round, you note the following findings on a patient's abdomen you were told to examine. Abdominal distension with an obvious mass in the left upper quadrant. What organ could be enlarged? What would cause this organ to be massively enlarged? Your consultant asks you to justify why the organ is not something else and give reasons that would justify your answer in A. So take your time and think through this. You can pause the video, by the way. Okay, so here comes the answer. So this is most obviously a spleen. So what may cause massive splenomegaly? You may have chronic myeloid leukemias, chronic lymphoid leukemias, hairy cell leukemias, infections such as malaria, EBV, and CMV, lymphomas, autoimmune hemolytic anemias, myelofibrosis, polycythemia vera, as well as sarcoidosis. Then your consultant wants you to justify why is this the spleen. So the first thing is that it's going to be enlarging towards the right iliac fossa. The second thing is that you can go above it. The third thing is that you can go below it. And the fourth thing is that it's dial to percussion and it has a notch that you can feel when you palpate. Then you know that obviously this is a spleen. Question 10. You conduct a urinalysis on a patient you clerked and find the following. Proteins 3 plus, nitrates negative, leukocytes negative, glucose negative, bilirubin negative. Give five causes of such results. List tests you would do to try and ascertain a cause. So I'll give you two seconds to think about this. Okay, here comes the answer. So this could be nephrotic syndrome. You're losing proteins in the urine. It could be preeclampsia or eclampsia if it's a female and they are pregnant past 20 weeks. It could be chronic kidney disease. It could be that this patient has multiple myelomas. It could be that this patient has congestive heart failure. Even dehydration may present to you with proteinuria. You may also have diabetes in the very early stages. Then list tests you would do to try and ascertain a cause, so you'd order for serum, urea, electrolytes, creatinine, a random blood sugar, or a fasting blood sugar. You order for an abdominal ultrasound, a kidney biopsy, a chest x-ray, as well as an ECG, and an echocardiograph. Station 11, a female 22 presents with hair loss and hand lesions as shown. She also has joint pains and fatigue. You suspect a diffuse connective tissue disease. What is the most likely diagnosis in this patient? What lesions are in the hands? Give one demand you would use if this lady wanted to conceive in the near future. So take your time, pause the video if you may. I'll give you a second to think through this. And what is your diagnosis? So here comes the answer. So most likely this woman has systemic lupus erythematosus and the lesions that she has in her hands, this look brownish. So this is more or less a discoid type of rash, though they are much smaller than uh, you would see on a discoid type of rash. Then give one DMARD that you can use. So you can use sulfasalazine. You could even use hydroxychloroquine. Those are not going to affect the conception of this woman and they are not contraindicated as opposed to the drugs like methotrexate. Station 12, a 35-year-old lady presents with headache for two weeks give relevant history list the questions do not write an essay so i'll give you two seconds to pause the video but here comes the answer so you'd ask for the location of the headache is it generalized or localized you'd ask for the timing of the headache is it in the morning or is it late at night or is it during the day you'd ask if it's intermittent or constant you ask for the character is it throbbing pounding or piercing you ask if there are any alleviating factors, like for example, painkillers, you ask for aggravating factors such as sound and light. You would also ask for associated symptoms such as seizures, fainting, 
visual changes, do they wear glasses? You ask about neck stiffness, fever, vomiting. You ask about projectile vomiting as well, palpitations, lightheadedness, dizziness that may point you towards anemia. You'd also have ask for a history of them being hypertensive. You ask for history of them having migraines, history of them having anemia or HIV. And you ask if they're taking any antihypertensive drugs such as nifedipine and a family history of migraines. Station 13, what is the clinical sign shown in the image? What is the diagnosis? List a differential diagnosis based on the image. What two tests would you do to confirm the diagnosis? Mention one drug that you would use to treat this condition. What advice would you give this patient who keeps presenting to hospital in severe pain despite taking all his prescribed drugs accordingly? So take your time, pause the video, subscribe if you haven't, drop a like, drop a comment, and here comes the answer. So these are toffee, or oh, toffus for uh, singular, toffee for plural. So this is tophaceous gout. So one differential would be rheumatoid arthritis, though this would be a very, very severe presentation. You would order for serum uric acid as well as a joint aspirate analysis. You can also do an x-ray. Then two drugs that can be used, or one drug rather, you could use colchicine, or you could also use allopurinol. Then one advice I should give this patient is one, to lose weight. Number two, to reduce their dietary purines. So if they're taking alcohol, you tell them to stop alcohol. If they eat a lot of fish, such as sardines, anchovies, trouts, you would tell them to reduce on that. If they eat a lot of meat, especially bacon, turkey, and liver, you tell them to reduce on that. Station 14, outline the respiratory findings you would elicit in a patient who has a large pneumothorax on the left side. So this is kind of similar to the question that we had on the pleural effusion because a pneumothorax and a pleural effusion are going to be causing more or less similar signs. The only difference is what you're going to be finding on percussion. With the pneumothorax, you would see a hyperresonant note. And then with a pleural effusion, you would see a dow, a stony dow note. Then list three causes of the pneumothorax. So here comes the answer. So on inspection, you would have an asymmetrical chest expansion with a trail sign on the right side. Then you would have features of respiratory distress, which I already talked about. You On palpation, you have deviation of the trachea to the right side, asymmetrical chest expansion, reduced tactile fremitus, you would have hyperresonance on percussion, as well as reduced air entry. Then three causes of a pneumothorax, it could be chest trauma, penetrating injuries especially, you could have malignancies such as mesotheliomas, you could have rupture of subpleural blebs, you could have mechanical ventilation that can lead to a pneumothorax, even iatrogenic causes, for example, during placement of intercostal chest drainage tubes. Then station 15, the pictures show scans of a 38-year-old patient with HIV infection with a CD4 count of 99 cells per microliter. What scan is on the right and what scan is on the left? What is the ob obviously seen in the scans? Give your diagnosis. Give two differential diagnoses based on the scan. What contraindications apply to the scan on the left? So take your time, look at these CTs. <laughs> I've given you the answer. Take your time, look at these scans. They're, they're both not anyways. And here comes the answer. So the one on the right, this one here is a CT scan. It's a non-contrast uh, or non-enhanced CT scan of the head. Then this one here is an MRI. So it's an axial uh, contrast um, T1 weighted MRI image. So we use contrast for this. It's an MRI image. And the contrast that's used is gadolium. So this is an MRI. This is a CT. This is an MRI with contrast. Then what we see if we look at here on the left, as we can see here, there are these bilateral parietal white matter lesions. And in the center, there is low attenuation. And there is also surrounding vasogenic um, edema around the ring, as we can see here, edema around the ring. So this is a presentation that is very commonly seen in CNS lymphoma. And two differentials would be, of course, cerebral abscess, or you could all have, this could be a tuberculoma. Then contraindications for using contrast, for example, if someone has previously reacted to the contrast or if they have acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease, if they are pregnant or if they are on metformin, then we want to desist from using contrast. Station 16 is another picture. Describe what you see in the picture. List four respiratory causes of this condition. List three gastrointestinal causes and list two cardiovascular causes. So you may pause the video right now, but here comes the answer. So this is obviously finger clubbing. There's a drumstick appearance here. 
and four causes respiratory it could be COPDs, lung fibrosis, bronchiectasis, lung cancers, pulmonary TB, mesotheliomas, even empyema. Three gastrointestinal causes like chronic liver disease, inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease. Two uh, cardiovascular conditions. A cyanotic congenital heart disease, subacute bacteria endocarditis. It could also be seen in left atrial myxomas. Station 17, a 53-year-old presented with a history of fever, sweats, abdominal pain, and constipation. Identify the abnormality on chest x-ray. What is the differential diagnosis? What resuscitative measures do you undertake? What is the definitive management? So take your time to pause the video and stay tuned for the X-ray week that will be coming very soon on the channel. Tell a friend, subscribe to the channel, drop a like and drop a comment. Here comes the answer. So this is obviously a double diaphragm sign. As we can see here, there's air under this diaphragm, which is obviously indicative that there may have been a perforation or a pneumoperitoneum air in the peritoneal cavity. So your differential diagnosis would be intestinal perforation secondary to typhoid fever in, if it's a medical case that has turned into a surgical case or intestinal perforation uh, or pneumoperitoneum secondary to an in, in intestinal obstruction that of course has ruptured. Then what resuscitative measures do you undertake? So you cannulate, you do your ABCs, you cannulate your patient, you run your fluids, you insert an NG tube to decompress and insert a urinary catheter. And of course, this patient needs surgery as a definitive management and you cover them on broad spectrum antibiotics. Station 18, study the image and answer the following questions. Name the clinical sign shown in the picture. What is the condition responsible for this clinical sign? Name the causes of this condition mentioned in B above. So take your time to pause the video right now. And here comes the answer. So this is obviously coilonic here. These are spoon-shaped nails and it's seen in iron deficiency. Causes of iron deficiency include things like reduced intake, like for example, with nutritional as well as dietary deficiencies, you may get increased demand, for example, in pregnancy, but this looks like a man's foot. And that's if it's a very, very nasty looking female's foot. Anyways, my bad. I shall not offend someone on this video. Then you may also have some chronic blood loss, such as chronic GI bleeding, hookworm infestations, malignancies. You may also have chronic diseases. You may also have diseases such as celiac disease. Then station 19, we're almost at the end. Describe the pathology shown in the chest x-ray. What is your diagnosis? What is the most likely causative organism causing this pathology? List any three complications of this disease entity. So take your time. Pause the video if you may. And here is the answer. So this is obviously a right-sided homogeneous opacity of the upper lobe. As we can see, there are some air bronchograms that we can see within this opacity. And of course, it's limited by the fissure here. And of course, you may also see that there's a silhouette sign that's affecting the right heart border. If you have no idea what these terms mean and they mean Greek to you, then stay tuned to next week on x-ray week, then we shall learn about all these terms. And then, so the diagnosis is obviously a loba pneumonia, and it's most likely caused by streptococcal pneumonia. And local complications include empyema thoracis, parapneumonic effusions, lung abscesses, distant complications include septic arthritis, meningitis, or co-pulmonale, which is a right-sided heart failure due to a pulmonary pathology. Then the drug of choice that you would use for this is obviously penicillins, but you could also use cephalosporins, the third generation cephalosporins. Station 20, and indeed the last, a 45-year-old man presents for routine HIV clinic. He's been on CART for four years on first line. On physical examination, you notice something on his chest. Name the sign. What is the cause of the sign in this patient? What are the causes of this condition in the general population? So take your time to think through this. Pause the video if you want. But here comes the answer. So this is obviously gynecomastia, and it's due to the ARVs that he's been taking, predominantly nevirapine. Even though nevirapine is no longer the first line, but I think by the time this question was set, at the time of this exam, nevirapine was still being used. But now the regimen has been changed to the TLD regimen, which is tenofovir, lamivudine, and doltegravir. Then what are, the com what are the causes of this condition in the general population? So you have liver cirrhosis, aging, obesity, hepatocellular carcinomas, hormonal replacement, estrogen secreting tumors, even some drugs such as spironolactone and finasteride. I hope this really helped. And if it did, subscribe to the channel, share the video, comment, drop a like, and all the best in your exams.
My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.